pretty awesome. He's a little gift, and he's so much better than Piper. Uh, we actually have gotten some sleep. I'm telling you, you're right. Number two is so much easier, uh, even though last night was actually kind of rough. I'm like operating on chops of four hours of sleep, and uh, so, you know, it is what it is. He's great. I love him. He's fantastic. Such a gift. So much, so much fun. And uh, he's just a little wonderful thing. And Piper has just done awesome with him. She, uh, she loves him, gives him kisses and hugs, and um, she's just absolutely fantastic. So we are really blessed. And I'm so grateful for the team that I've had here, Chris and Kyle, being able to preach and deliver the word um, while I got to enjoy my little baby boy. So thank you all for your prayers and your encouragement, um, and for the church just giving me the opportunity to uh, have a break away for a few weeks. Well, we are on number four, uh, the fourth and final sermon in our series called Rescue. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Titus chapter three. That's where we're going to be today. And we've been talking about how we are on a rescue mission on behalf of God. And uh, the first sermon that Kyle gave was uh, discussing John chapter four, how in order to be on the rescue mission that God has given us, we have to view people like Jesus. If we don't view people like Jesus, Chris discussed the following week that we need to pursue people like Jesus. Well, If we don't view people like Jesus, we won't pursue them the way that Jesus would. And then last week, Kyle talked about uh, renewing our tactics and doing whatever it takes. And so uh, we need to review our methods to make sure that they're in line with, are we reaching Jesus the way that he reached people? And so fourth and finally today, we're going to be talking about what it means to be renewed like Jesus, to have a renewed state, uh, a renewed position, a renewed nature, so to speak. And so we're going to be getting into Titus chapter 3 where he gives us this double cure. If we're going to be renewed like Jesus, we need to be repaired and we need to be restored. Um, You know, I don't know about you, but I've actually had a few run-ins with the law. Yes, believe it or not. And it's like most people, okay? I'm not like a criminal that does terrible things. But sometimes I get speeding tickets every once in a while. Okay, sorry, that's, that, that does happen. Uh, a few times I did some things as a kid. I was a little rascal. Uh, it's terrible, okay? So please don't judge me, but it's just real. I was a jerk, and I stole cigarettes from Walmart in the fifth grade. Okay, I just want to get it out there and confess. I know, it's horrible. I also smoked them, uh, and by them I mean one, and I gagged and almost threw up. Okay, so I learned my lesson there. Uh, but it was bad, all right? I should have got punished. I should have got caught. If Walmart sees this and they go back in time, I guess, yes, that's, that's me. But I did a terrible thing, right? I should have been punished, and my mom never knew about it. And so if she sees the sermon, now she knows. Uh, might be a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. But I've done some terrible things. I ran away from home once, okay? It was pretty bad. Uh, I did some, did some bad stuff that night. I was in the sixth grade when I ran away from home. A lot of you parents are sitting there thinking, how did Rick ever become a preacher? And it's true. And then you're thinking, wow, my kids actually aren't really that bad. (laughs) I was raised in the church too. Go figure. Anyways, so, you know, I did did some terrible stuff. But I've never stood um, before a judge uh, and really like as a criminal and facing prison time or time in jail or anything like that. And that would be a terrible thing to be, right? Um, I think one of the worst things that you can do is, is be in a car accident, for instance, and be the cause of that car accident, and not only have your body damaged, but also be in trouble with the law because you broke the law. I have two cousins um, that are twins, uh, Tiffany and Tanya, and we used to visit this campground called Seneca Lake in Ohio, and it was, it was one of the favorite things that we would do every summer. And so they would go, my entire family would go, and we would camp out. Um, My grandfather had kind of like an RV, but we would sleep in tents because we were, you know, the grandkids. But we liked it. That's what we wanted to do. And Tiffany and Tanya, they were, like I said, twins, and they actually met another pair of twins, Justin and Jordan. And so they hit it off. You know, there's a basketball court there, and you could go swimming. You could play volleyball. And so um, they really got along, and so they decided that they were going to date each other. Uh, They lived about three hours apart. And they had dated each other probably for about a year when really tragedy uh, struck. They were driving in an SUV. Uh, Justin and Jordan were sitting up front. Tiffany and Tanya were in the middle. And then they had two other friends which were uh, in the back seat. And we got a phone call early in the morning that there had been an accident. Justin, when he was driving, uh, was on a gravel road and he was driving too fast. And he ended up turning the car over nine times. My cousin Tanya, and this is many years ago, my cousin Tanya broke her neck. And she had to have a halo installed on, on, her, on her body. And if you don't know what that is, they basically drill into your skull four screws. And they also uh, mount the screws in your collarbone as well so that you can't move your neck um, so that you can be healed. 
And so she had to wear that for, for many, many months, really terrible thing um, that she had to go through. But when they had the accident, they were recounting this to us, and the entire car was smashed in, and almost everyone was, was thrown from the vehicle, um, specifically Justin, who was driving, and his brother Jordan, who was up front. And Justin got tossed out of the window uh, for the driver's seat, and unfortunately, they weren't wearing their seatbelts. And Jordan got tossed out through the moonroof. And so as you can imagine, after an accident like that, uh, Tiffany and Tanya were able to climb out of the car, and the last two were able to climb out the back. And they're going around and making sure everyone's okay. And one person who they hadn't found yet was Jordan, Justin's brother, who was sitting in the passenger seat. And then about 50 yards away, they saw him curled up like a ball on the pavement, uh, and they went to, uh, you know, see if he was okay, and he wouldn't wake up. He had actually died on impact. Um, and so it was a, it was a huge tragedy. Uh, all of them, like I said, my cousin Tanya broke her neck. Uh, they had a lot of cuts, bruises, broken bones. Uh, the two um, that were in the back seat, they were dating. Uh, they were really damaged uh, as well. And so it was just, it was just such a, a horrible situation. Uh, their bodies were in desperate need of repair. But as many of you know, when something like that happens, there's two types of responders that come to the scene. There's the ambulance, because people need their bodies healed. But then there's also the police officers, because they need to see if the law was broken. And that's the same thing for us. All of us have been in this accident that we call sin. We have broken spirits, broken souls, but we also have broken God's law. And unfortunately, Justin, despite all that he went through, losing his brother, suffering all of that pain, uh, and especially being the driver, he actually had to go to a court of law because the two people who were sitting in the back sued him um, to cover their damages and their medical costs and the pain and suffering, and he was sued for millions of dollars in court. And that's the hard thing about breaking the law, is that no matter what you suffer or what you go through, you still have to rectify the situation. It still has to be restored before a judge. And that's the same thing with our sin, is that God has two different approaches to us when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to rescuing us. We have to stand before God 100% restored, but God also wants to repair us. He wants to heal us. He wants to make us whole again. And so God does this through our salvation, and Paul talks about this when he's writing to Timothy. Paul was encouraging, or excuse me, Titus, Paul was encouraging Titus, Titus, I want you to teach the people to do good things. And the first few verses, he talks about living in humility and respecting the law, but then he goes on to talk about our salvation experience. And so the first thing that we're going to look at this morning is that the fact that we are all truly broken, and we are in desperate need of repair. God really wants to make us whole again. He doesn't just want to make us right with him, but he wants to heal our broken souls. He wants to heal the sickness of sin that we're infected with. Look at verse 3 with me. Paul is talking to this Christian church, and he looks back to a point in time, and he says, look, this is what we used to be like. He says in verse 3, we were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our entire life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Paul says, look at, look at how far we've come. Look at how we used to behave. If you could think of it like this, it would be like Justin today, who, by the way, has married Tiffany. Uh, they stayed together even despite their, um, you know, circumstances and the obstacles that they had to overcome. And they're married, and they have two beautiful children, and they love the Lord, and they go to church, uh, and they're faithful to him despite what they had to go through. But it would be like Justin looking back today and saying, man, look at some of the things that I used to do. I mean, how foolish it was to drive on a gravel road and not have everyone wear their seatbelts. And I think everybody in this room can point to some times in our history where we have really made some terrible mistakes. And maybe we've suffered for it. Maybe we got by from it, like a fifth grader stealing cigarettes from Walmart, right? A complete moron. But there are times in our life that we can point back to and say, man, I really messed up. And it either was really bad or it could have been really bad. And I am ashamed of that. And Paul reminds people, he reminds the church, he reminds these Christians, this is how we used to live. The first thing that he says is, first of all, we were foolish of God. We were ignorant of God himself. And I bet everyone can think of a moment like that, or maybe you're even in that moment right now, where you just don't know a whole lot about God, 
or about Jesus or about what it means to be a Christian. And when you compare your life with the Bible, you're like, wow, my life is a mess. I really don't know God. I don't have a personal relationship with him. Paul says, that's who we used to be. He says, second of all, we were disobedient. This means to go astray. It means to constantly wander away from God like a sheep wandering away from its pastor. And that's what sheep do what sheep do, right? Sheep do sheep things. They wander away. They get caught up in the distractions of eating grass and just wandering off on their own. Sometimes it's intentional, and other times it's just because they're sheep, and sheep wander, and they go astray. But Paul says, look, we, we went astray. We were disobedient from God. We wandered away from him. The third thing that he says is that, man, we were deceived. Not only did we go astray, but we led other people astray as well. And guess who accompanied Rick Bonifield in the fifth grade when he went to Walmart on his raid mission? His sister and his cousin, right? Have you ever noticed that the company that you keep, and if it's bad company, you tend to influence each other to do bad things? Maybe gossip, right? Once you hang out with certain individuals and everybody's and everybody starts gossiping. Maybe it is stealing. Maybe it is drunkenness. I don't really know what it is that exactly you're influenced to do, but everybody in this room can point to a time and say, man, this isn't what God wanted for my life. I was living a disobedient life. Maybe you're living a disobedient life now. And then he lists two other things which uh, have to do with slavery, this lack of self-discipline, this enslavement. And there have been a few sins in my life that are just really, have, have seemed really hard to break. And you know, some things that you kind of pick up in your childhood that maybe stick with you as you live your life, and they're things that you constantly battle. My father was an alcoholic, and he was an alcoholic from the time that he went to the bar as a 16-year-old and, and drank beer to all the time, uh, even when he was alcohol-free for the last 12 years of his life. That addiction and that craving never left him. Some people, it's pornography. Some people, it's being angry and having a short fuse. There are a lot of things that we can be enslaved to, but the two things that Paul points out here is he says, first of all, we were enslaved to lust. These are uncontrolled passions and desires. These are desires that go beyond their intended boundaries, right? For instance, everybody in this room probably has a sexual desire. But where it becomes lust is when that sexual desire goes beyond its intended boundaries that God designed for us. Anger can be a good thing when it's used in the right way and it's expressed in the right way. God has wired us with emotions and abilities, and they need to be funneled and channeled through the right means. But when those desires get the best of us, they go beyond their intended boundaries, right? And so he lists here lust. And then he also says we were enslaved to pleasures. These are desires that are satisfied at a cost to holiness. You're faced with what God wants you to do, but you please yourself beyond the intended purposes. I love food. Food is delicious. One of my favorite things to do, one of the things I, yes, I spend the most money on, right? But when we are gluttonous and we eat more than our bodies were designed to take, right, we fall into the temptation of sin. Money is a blessing from God. It used to be animals and food and land. Now it's, you know, currency that represents gold that we really don't have, but that's a different point. But, yeah, But here's the thing, like money is a good thing when it's used the way that God wants us to have it. And so we can be enticed into these lusts and these pleasures and they become an enslavement. Paul says, that's what we used to be like. And then the third category that he gets into here are destructive habits. The first thing that he lists is malice. This is wickedness. It's a life that is turned towards evil. It's an attitude. It's a feeling that you are just malicious towards other people. It's having an inclination towards evil, right? Or negativity. You always find a way to spin it to be evil or to spin it to be wrong. There's always something wrong with the situation rather than right with the situation. And so it carries this idea of having a desire to injure and repay evil for evil. It's a wickedness, in other words, that isn't ashamed. People who do evil things, they frankly don't care. They don't care what God thinks. They don't care what other people think. They're going to do wicked things, and other people are going to have to deal with it. And I think this probably really resonates with our culture, right? And probably really resonates for you. I mean, I can look back to some points in my life where I was living in sin, and I was stubborn, and I didn't really care. I can specifically remember my teenage years, I stopped going to church because, frankly, I just didn't want to go, right? A lot of our teenagers get to that point. 
My mom was doing traveling medical work, so 16, 17, 18 years old, um, I was working, taking myself to school. Uh, she would help provide for, like, you know, the income for the house and send us money for food. But for the most part, I was kind of self-sufficient as a teenager. And I can remember that I just lost self-discipline. I didn't go to church. And I was uh, asleep, stayed up late Saturday night, and then I hear a knock on the door at about 1 o'clock. And guess who it is? It's Grandpa Miracle, right? That was his last name. Not like it's cool. Yeah, I know. His last name was Miracle. I'm like, man, I missed out on that one, you know? I could change it if I wanted to, but that would be weird. So Grandpa comes knocking on the door. He says, hey, man, just come in to check in on you, see why you're not at church, right? That type of accountability. And so we can fall into this to where, and frankly, I didn't really care at that point. I didn't care, you know, that Grandpa was there. I mean, I felt embarrassed, but after he left, I was like, oh, I don't really care. <laughs> Sometimes teenagers can get like that, parents of teenagers. Can I get an amen? Right? Yeah, they're like, I don't care what you say. I'm not doing it. <laughs> You're like, get out. <laughs> the second thing that he lists under this idea of destruction is what we call envy. And envy is really, really evil because it takes jealousy to a whole nother level right? Jealousy is wanting what other people have, but envy is wanting what other people have and wishing injury upon them that they lose what they do have. It's like having a beautiful singing voice, right? Such as myself. And you want my singing, it's really not that great. I think it's great because I don't hear myself, okay? But it's like me having a beautiful singing voice and you want Rick's singing voice and then you hope I get an injury and I can't sing anymore. Isn't that sick? Like that's really destructive. But Paul says, Man, that's who we used to be. That's the kind of life that we lived. You not only wanted to be the richest person, but you hoped everyone lost their riches. You not only wanted to succeed at your job, but you hoped everyone failed so that you could shine brighter. That's what it means to envy. And then the third thing that he kind of summarizes together is that we not only were hated, but we hated other people. And I think we all know what that means, to hate somebody. That's who we used to live like. That's what we used to be. And so Paul was pointing back to a point in time when he says, look, guys, we at one point in time had drifted away from God living in sin, and the picture was not good. And everybody in this room has either been at that point or is at that point. The Bible is very clear. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that sin ultimately is punished with death. And so I've got some bad news for you, right? God is going to hold us accountable in a court of law called the heavenly court for our sins. And our sin not only puts it as odd with God, but it also destroys the very soul and the very nature that God designed for us to have. And what happens when you get sick and you don't find a cure? You ultimately get sicker, which leads ultimately to death. And so if we don't find a way to reverse this curse, if we don't find a way to be restored back in God's favor, we are destined with eternal separation from God. I mean, we need to be rescued. And thankfully, God sent his son on a rescue mission. And God has sent his Christians, us, on a rescue mission to heal, repair, and restore the people in this world. Look at what Titus goes on to describe here, or Paul describing to Titus. He says in verse 4, But, man, it's a good but, but when the kindness of our God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God saw us living in sin, and he decided to take action out of kindness, out of love, and out of mercy. And I am so thankful that he did. You know how thankful I am when first responders show up to the scene to help repair and restore and protect you? I've told many of you about this uh, before, and some of you haven't been here when I did tell it. Man, I felt sick to my stomach when Angel was clipping Piper's fingernails and I said, here, honey, let me do it. She says, no, no, I'm going to do it because she really likes to pay you know, close attention to detail. And I say, come on, man, I'm dad. I can do this. And I, man, I got in on that thumb, and I put that fingernail clipper right there, and it looked pretty good to me. And I, I cut off the front of her thumb, and I, was, I saw this big piece of flesh roll away, and it started bleeding, and Piper just, it was like a delayed like, response, you know what I mean? 
And I'm like breaking out in a hot sweat, and Angel starts crying, and Piper's throwing up, and I'm calling the 911, like I think I just like chopped off my child's finger. And the first guy that was there was a police officer. You know why? Because he wanted to find out, he wanted to help, but he needed to find out, is there an abusive situation going on here? Has the law been broken? And once he found out that I was just a complete moron, (laughs) he started to try to console me, you know what I mean? I was just like, I can't believe I did this. And then thankfully the ambulance came and they checked her out and they were able to put pressure and she, poor little thing, had to wear a glove for many weeks and she's not going to know, you know, today or in the future. But man, I mean, I just felt terrible. It was horrible. I get sick just thinking about it. about ready to pass out myself, right? So I, I don't do well with blood, by the way. I am complete, like, you know, not even going to say it. I'm just not good with it. And so anyways, I don't, I don't know why I told you that. No, I know why. So there are two people who respond to the scene, Right? Two people, the ambulance and the police officers. Well, first of all, what's the point of the ambulance, right? The medical professionals, they want to heal what has been broken. And so the first thing that we talk about when it comes to being saved and being healed is this word, regeneration. It means God is starting to take apart and repairing our broken souls. Regeneration can be defined like this. It is a single moment in time when a sinner passes from his lost state into his saved state. It is a work that God performs on our soul, and when we say God saved me, we point back to that specific time in our life when God began to regenerate the sick soul that we were infected with sin. It's an incredible moment. It's when we experience this inward change of the soul. And don't, don't mistake this, okay? A lot of people mistake regeneration for the moral change that they experience when they want to become a follower of Jesus right? They point back to that time. Maybe they were convicted through uh, crying. They realize, I am a sinner in need of God's grace. I need God. God, please save me. And they cry out to him, and they say a prayer. A lot of people mistake that point in time for the moment of regeneration. Well, that's not the point in time when you're regenerated, all right? That's a step in the process to lead to regeneration, And so don't mistake regeneration for that time where you felt convicted and you wanted to be a follower of Jesus, That's when faith began. It's also not a physical change, right? Our souls are immaterial. They are metaphysical. They're not made up of physical stuff. And so it's not as if God somehow physically changes you. That's not what it means to be regenerated. The idea is simply this. We all have damage that sin inflicts upon our soul. And it begins to condition us in such a way that we develop this sinful nature. So sinning is just instinctful, right? Maybe some of you have, husbands have a short fuse, and your anger is just instinct. Maybe a lot of you guys, you see an attractive woman, and lust is just instinct. Maybe some of you ladies struggle with gossip, and so when you get together with the ladies and you start talking, it's just instinct. It becomes second nature, so to speak. And so when we are regenerated, God starts to peel back those layers of sin and sickness, and he starts to reverse the curse. If I could, if I could give you an example... My cousin Tanya broke her neck. She had to have that halo installed on on her body and in her skull. And it was at that moment in time when her neck started the repairing process, right? It's kind of the same moment when we are regenerated. But it took many months for the healing process to be complete. And that's the same way with our regeneration. When God begins to repair us, we don't come up out of baptism, oh, look, I'm perfect. (laughs) This is great. I'm never going to make a mistake again. And sometimes we as Christians can be discouraged because the repairing process can take a long time. In fact, it's going to take your entire life. God is on a mission to repair your broken soul, and it's going to take the commitment of your entire life. But it is a wonderful, beautiful thing. And so much like Tanya, who had to heal her broken neck, so God is going to heal our broken souls. And when we consider our regeneration, God initially operates us, he says, when we are washed. The washing of regeneration. The Greek word for washing here is lutron. It comes from the verb luo. It means to wash the entire body. What Paul was pointing back to, a single point in time, he says, when you were baptized, when you were washed, God began the regeneration process. That's the moment in time when he began to heal your broken soul. And so what did God do, the Bible says? God saved us. 
And this is interesting. When it says God saved us, it's in the aorist tense. And if, it's, if you know anything about language, specifically the Greek language, the aorist tense puts this uh, verb, this phrase, in such a way that it points back into a single point in time with a progressive action going into the future. I can look back in that moment and I can say that's when God began to do his work. That's when God began to save me. But he adds some clarifiers here. First of all, he says, God saved me out of his kindness and love. What is that? What did God do that was so kind? What did God do that was so loving? Well, I could explain that to you very easily. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only unique son. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. That was his act of love and his act of kindness. That's when God moved towards us, when we were running away from him. And that was an act of God's grace. And then he goes on to say, and this is so beautiful, and if you could please take this home with you today, it will be a life changer. He says, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. And man, am I glad. I am so glad that God has not decided to save me based on my performance. There is nothing that you can do to earn God's salvation. There is nothing that you can do to merit God's salvation or to gain God's salvation. The only thing that you can do is accept it. And you accept it the way God asks you to accept it. And how does he ask us to accept it? He says through the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, he says, It is by grace that you have been saved. Not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast. There is not a single person in this room who is any better than the next person. It doesn't matter if you've been in this church for 50 years or for five days. You get God's salvation the exact same way. It is a grace, it is a gift that you do not deserve. And everyone has the opportunity to have that gift. He goes on to say this, it was according to God's mercy Grace is getting a gift that you don't deserve. And mercy, how I see mercy, is not getting what you do deserve. Every single person in this room deserved to stand before the judge being God and receive our penalty and our punishment. But God didn't give us that. Instead, he gave us grace. And do you know who got your punishment? Jesus did. That's right. The grand exchange that took place. And so God has saved us. He's given us the grace of Jesus by dying on the cross. And then he goes on to say this. He also says, by the renewal of the Holy Spirit that was poured out on us. This spirit literally makes us new. And there's different kinds of of words for new in the Bible. There's this word that he uses here, which means it's kainos, right? It means a new of a different kind. It's like, have you ever re-gifted something for Christmas? right? If you say that you haven't, you're probably lying, because everybody has. We have all probably re-gifted something in some way, shape, or form, right? And so it's not a new gift. It's an old gift that you're just repackaging and giving to somebody else. That's not really new, okay? You got to go out and buy something brand new, off the shelf, unused, factory sealed, and then you get a new gift. That's what the Spirit does in our own life. He doesn't give us a repackaged old us, He gives us something new of a different kind. And that's a wonderful, beautiful thing. The Spirit really, truly makes us new. And so we have to ask ourselves this question, all right? We know what God did. He saved us out of his kindness, his love, his mercy by sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. But the question comes this morning, when did God do it? Now, like I said, a lot of people mistake their regeneration from the time they have an emotional experience to where they weep, they cry, they feel like they want to follow Jesus. But that's not what Titus says, and that's not what the rest of the Bible describes as the time or the occasion of salvation. Very crystal clear. We are saved by grace through the channel of faith and not by works, lest anyone can boast, okay? But there is a time when God says, I view that person as a saved individual. Just like a point in time when a doctor says, I view this person as a healed individual. You can go. You don't have to take medicine anymore. Your cancer's gone. Your neck is healed. You are restored. And so he says it's by the washing of regeneration. And like I said, this refers to our baptism. Baptism is the time of salvation, not the means of our salvation. And when you read the Bible, baptism is never placed in the category of works. 
Just because it is something that you do, right, technically it's something that's being done to you, does not...